Welcome everybody to today's VVBGA UVM extension webinar focused on two invasive pests, jumping worms and spotted lanternfly. And our first speaker is Dr. Joseph Gores from the University of Vermont Plant and Soil Science Department. And he will be giving us an update on jumping worms or biology and some management options. Take it away, Joseph. Yeah, welcome all. Um... It's a real pleasure to talk to uh, real people, <laughs> which are vegetable growers and uh, and and berry berry growers, and I'm, I suspect I have a few other people sitting there too. But so what you see there is is a uh, is one of the culprits that I'm working with. Uh, this is an Amenthes agrestis, is one of the three three uh, jumping worms of concern. The the latest on naming these worms is. You're supposed to call them jumping worms. Uh, that seems to be the consensus amongst the community now. And so I'll call them that rather than the other things I might have called them in the past. So um, ju so jumping worms, uh, one of the things that, that you need to know about them is that you can identify them pretty well in the summer. Probably beginning of August, you will start seeing these, uh, seeing adults of this, this worm. The adult it, uh, is identified by this ring around the collar. And in jumping worms, it goes all the way around. And I'll say more a little bit, little bit more about how to identify them properly. But uh, that that is what um, what this is about, right? So jumping worms. The, actually, what you see there, they're sitting on this particular jumping worm is sitting on its castings uh, or frass, and um, you notice that it's it's very globular, very uh, you know, it's it's, it's these small um, aggregates that hold together pretty well. But they're very loose when you look at the aggregates as, as a whole. Um, they're pretty loose, so you can move these these aggregates around, uh, and that is a problem uh, because of rooting and potentially uh, because of erosion problems. Like you know, you would have you wouldn't have to detach these castings in order for them to erode away. They're already detached. So why this talk? Uh, so currently, you know, most. The most mostly this affects ornamental horticulture, horticulture and forestry, uh, and you know you might throw composters in there as well. Uh, and uh, you know you're not the first ones that I'm talking to. The New Jersey Vegetable Growers Association Convention in 2021 uh, invited me to give a, a talk on on these worms. Um, there are some reports from a colleague of mine out of Massachusetts uh, where he says, well, there they are occurring in agricultural fields now. And then um, you could you could argue that some fruit and berry operations are not all that different from horticultural uh, production that you find might find in in tree nurseries. So of course you want to know whether you are at risk. If you have them already, you are definitely at risk because you have them, <laughs> one hundred percent risk. Uh, but if you're not not yet affected, then you want to think about: uh, Do you mulch any kind of production beds? Uh, are those uh, untilled beds? So are they are they there pretty much all the time? These, these beds, you, you go back there and you, you create seed beds or whatever you do or beds for for planting. Uh, and are they are they untilled? So if they are if they're untilled, then you probably have uh, you're probably at risk, especially if you mulch as well. And the risk is even even greater if you irrigate the beds. And so you're basically saying, well. What can I do? Because this is what I do. <laughs> uh, you also at risk if you bring in commercial compost. More on that later. If you bring in leaf mulch, uh, or if you bring in wood mulch, all those three materials and others that I'm not naming here uh, could be vectors of your uh, of your jumping worms. Lower risk if you don't till. Then we think you are at. If, so if you do till then I think you're at lower risk. If you think that you're like a blueberry farm and you're, lower, you're lowering your pH, you think that you're at, at lower risk. Uh, pH does not seem to make a difference, at least not in the range of uh, like, you know, 3.5 to seven or eight pH. So what are these curious creatures? Well, first of all, how many are there? So there's three that have been uh, recorded in Vermont. Um, they're probably, if you go a bit further south, and maybe into into New Hampshire and uh, upstate New York, you probably have you might have two more, uh, but the three big ones uh, that we have in Vermont are pretty much problems across the Northeast. 
There's 16 jumping worm species in North America. There's over a thousand megascolecidae in the world, and they're not all jumping worms, uh, but that's basically the family that jumping worms are in. How they get here? There's two things. So on, on the East Coast, anecdotally, they've, they've been associated with the gift of cherry blossoms to the to, to DC. The first batch of cherry blossoms that came in was not phytosanitized. And so those trees got ripped out two weeks, sorry, two years later, uh, once people figured out that they hadn't done that. And then there was new trees coming back uh, from Japan uh, that were phytosanitized. And so I think the first batch People, people think that the first batch of these trees might have brought them over. On the West Coast, so we're talking 1908. On the West Coast, they were seen a lot earlier, 1860s, uh, and this might have just been a, a factor that, uh, you know, uh, Japan started opening the trade with the rest of the world again in, in the 1850s. Where in the Northeast? So here are the georeference sites, uh, the, the white and the, and the, uh, and the uh, black, dots here are where, where they've been seen. Uh, you might see some clusters. Those clusters are associated with people who do that kind of research. Uh, they are probably in many, many other places. If you want to find out more about where there might be more specifically and uh, to closer, closer in location, um, then you might want to go to uh, um, apps like IMAP Invasive, so I, iNaturalist, they're being recorded there. Um, how did they get around? Uh, they, you know, you, you might say, well, DC got those in 2008. How did they get get to other places? So the, the big, the big ways of moving them around is horticulture. So potted plants, um, uh, plants uh, in, in root balls, uh, but also nowadays. Uh, um, you might get, be able to buy these worms as either so soil conditioners or uh, as bait. So that's another way that they move around. You can get them on the internet. And then of course there's vermicomposting. A lot of the vermicomposting cultures come from the South are contaminated with these worms. So not, they're not 100% Icenia fetida or the, the red wiggler. So you see a couple of other features on this map. So obviously the, the dots, but the other really important one is, is this line between the lighter beige color and the darker gray color here. That is the extent to, to where they might be able to um, survive given the nature of the ecosystems and the climate in those areas. So they need, they need about 90 days to go from hatching, from hatchling to, um, to adults, so generating new, new little ones, if you want. Uh, they need these 90 days. And if, they, if, if the frost-free period is shorter than 90 days, they probably won't make it. And so that line is basically saying, or those, that gray area is where the frost-free period is greater than 90 days. But you notice it goes almost all the way up to Hudson Bay. And one of the dangers of that is of course that, you know, you've got lots of organic matter up there that might be decomposed and then that might, uh, that might then add to uh, climate change. How do you identify these worms? So I already mentioned one thing that's, that's this thing here. Once, once the adults, you can tell. If they're not adults, you cannot tell. It's difficult to identify them other than with molecular methods. Uh, so you just look at the DNA. But the big question, the first big question is, if you want to identify jumping worms is, does the clitellum go all the way around the worm? So clitellum is that ring around the collar. If it goes all the way around that, that worm and it's really in color, well offset from the rest of the worm, then you have a phrytomoid, which is another way of saying jumping worm. Otherwise you have European worms. The next, the next question that you might want to ask is, you know, how, how big are these guys? Because the size seems to make a difference here in, in, in the Northeast. So here in the Northeast, if the worms are less than five centimeters when they're adults, then you have a Minthus tokiensis. It's one of the big three uh, worms of, of concern. Uh, this is this does not work in the rest of the world. So northeast, yes, maybe even in, over into Wisconsin and and uh, Minnesota. But in Japan, they're about the same size as the other two worms that are of concern. So it works here, but if you go to Japan and you want to tell by that, it doesn't work. And the next, so that's that gives us an answer. And then there's a thing that says no. There's a question mark. And the reason why there's a question mark is because of this. Oops. Because of this, <laughs> all right. So 
Uh, what I really meant to say is, you notice there's a gap between the five centimeters and the nine centimeters. There's a lot of overlap in size between Amynthus tokiensis and particularly Amynthus agrestis. So you can only tell that you have Amynthus agrestis if the worm is greater than nine centimeters. And in addition that it does not have these two markings on the belly side of the, the worm, five segments ahead of the clitellum. I'll show you a picture in a second. Uh, bear with me, you say, where is that picture? Uh, so if there's if the two markings are not present, Amynthus agrestis, if the two markings are present, Metaphyre Hilgendorfi. And so here's here's here are the two markings. They, they're kind of faint on this picture, but they're right there. You know, just look at that blue circle and look at the mouse moving around on it. Uh, and they're really well, they're really visible uh, on the live worm. So if you turn turn that worm over, it's usually the paler side of the worm. Uh, then you, if you see those those two dots, you have Metaphyre Hilgendorfi. Um, they're super, so they're, they're thought of as being pathogenetic, which means uh, they, one worm can create a colony of worms uh, that don't need a friend. But, but uh, the genetic diversity is much greater than what you expect from clones. So when you have pathogenetic worms, usually you expect there to be a very narrow range of genetic diversity. And so we looked at that uh, for Amynthus tokiensis and Amynthus agrestis. And in the fall, we actually be getting to looking at that for Metaphyhilgendorfi as well. But for Amynthus agrestis, if you look at this one nursery here, uh, they, we took 26 samples and there was 23 genotypes there. So almost 100%, almost, almost all of them were different from each other. And that just means, is that really pathogenetic? So we don't know. We're going to do some experimentations on that uh, to see whether they can actually mate. What is the life cycle? Um, oh yeah, so I should say, uh, Amethyst tokiensis seems to be a lot more clonal uh, in comparison. Um, and at the pre presently, we're working on, on, on a hypothesis that, that there might actually be both, that there might be some that are um, that are pathogenic and some of them that are hermaphrodites, those, those can have sex and recombination. So what's the life cycle? Well, you know, uh, we, let's start with the cocoons. Uh, the cocoons come before the worm, um, but we can argue that too later if you want. So here's the cocoons. They go through a bunch of stages uh, from just, the, you can just see the albumen in the cocoons and then you get larvae that develop over time, these embryos. And then eventually you get, a, you get um, hatchlings that are about, uh, an inch to 0.75 of an inch long. And then it takes about 90 days to go from hatchling to adult. And then they have about 120 days to create cocoons. Uh, so, and the cocoons lo really look like this. They're, they're spherical um, when they are inflated and inflation happens uh, during warmer, moister periods of, of the year and during droughts and winter, the cocoons deflate and they look like this. They look like deflated soccer balls. Um, <clears throat> I would like to draw your attention also to, uh, to this graph. Uh, we have abundance per meter squared, to divide by 10 to get a per, per foot square um, on the y-axis. And then, and then we have dates on the, on the x, sorry, on the y-axis, no, dates on the x-axis. And you notice that there's this gray area up here. And this is the, the, the time of the year when you see the first adults. So it's actually quite a big span. Some years we have them in the beginning of July and some years it's the middle of August that they appear. That's like a long span. And it all really depends on the temperature and the moisture of, uh, of the soil. So if you are, uh, if, if you are uh, mulching and you are also uh, irrigating, then you probably see them earlier. In fact, in some gardens that are irrigated, not mine, but in other gardens, uh, I've seen them, I've seen the adults as early as end of May. So it all depends on, on the climatic factors. But you notice that the peak, the peaks are around about uh, maybe four to six weeks earlier than the first adult emergence. And that's kind of important because if you want to control them, you want to you want to target the controls to these peaks. That would give you the biggest bang for the buck. And you might have to do it again uh, because there, notice here is the number of worms is increasing again. And that's probably because you have a second 
uh, batch of worms hatching. So effects on other organisms, there's effect on us. So there is actually supposedly an emotional response to these worms now because everybody sees them and people say, I'm now in a new era of gardening. I'm a new era of nursery work. I'm a new, new era of, of growing uh, blueberries. <clears throat> and, uh, it's, and grief is, is an important uh, driver of, of our emotions and all that. So there, we, there's effects on us. So we are evolving slowly from Homo sapiens sapiens to Homo sapiens tristesicus, and uh, we are very trist about all of that. So this is a really neat diagram that uh, is in this uh, paper by Froelich et al. Uh, and uh, it looks at cascades. Cascades are basically something happens in the ecosystem and it kicks off a whole bunch of other events. And so that's called a ecological cascade. And in this case, you know, uh, Lee Froelich is, is uh, talking about micro cascades that happen in place. So, you know, the earthworm comes in, it changes the soil structure that changes, uh, and it changes the way uh, that uh, nutrients are cycled um, through the soil, it might change some of the physical properties of the soil as well. Um, and all that will have an effect on the habitat of plants and animals. And, um, and it, it, that would basically change the plant community. And then there's the bigger effect that's more societal effects that include soil and water quality, forest and crop product productivity, wildlife habitat, and so on. Uh, so so uh, Lee is, is, has, has a whole long list of things that can happen. Um, the net effect here in Vermont that we're worried about is in forest net effect on vegetation. So we're looking at, on the left-hand side, there's a picture of, of camel sump, uh, no earthworms, and then forest invaded by Amenthus agrestis in South Burlington. They're both uh, sugar maple, uh, sugar maple dominated uh, places. And the, the difference is striking. And it's not just the worms that are involved in this. So the worms prepare the way, but by altering the soil, uh, the soil structure and thereby altering uh, the seed bank um, of the soil, ger the germination medium of that soil. Uh, but whatever is left after that happens, uh, the deer comes in and, and feeds on it. And what is left usually are kind of some woody, um, woody uh, seedlings, and the deer will take care of those. And so we are really worried about maple syrup and foliage to be, uh, being, you know, the, the pleasures that we uh, get from those to be sustainable over the next 50, 60 years. Uh, if effect on potential predators. Some people say, oh, where are the predators? Well, uh, there are predators, but these worms bioaccumulate toxic trace metals. And so you really want, don't really want to have the hawk feed on a lot of these, these, uh, these worms. How about my plants, you will ask, right? So uh, you're, you're growing stuff uh, for a reason. You want, you want to make a profit. You want to live. You have to pay, pay your bills and you have to worry about your plants. So uh, corporate extension, uh, both Maine and Cornell Corporate Corporative Extension have uh, have uh, fact sheets that will say things like this: In nurseries and greenhouses, immense worms reduce the functionality of soils and planting media and cause severe drought symptoms. After irrigating irrigation or rains, uh, you find worms under the pots, and so they like to come out during that. They like to kind of find find space outside the pots when it rains. So that's one way of of being able to tell. Um, and and here's, here's the way they move around. Uh, and then there's another one that says, jumping worms can severely damage roots of plants in nursery gardens, turf, forests, and turf. They, along with other invasive worms, can also help spread invasive plant species by disturbing the soil. Um, so one, one thing, so that includes weeds. Um, so we had an experiment, with, we actually have had a few experiments with plants, uh, but one was particularly geared towards figuring out what is the effect of, of these snake worms. I should call them jumping worms. I don't want to give snakes a bad name. Um, uh, so jumping worms, uh, when they are present, uh, this happens. So anyway, I should describe this experiment. So uh, uh, this, is, this is when you grow the cilantro from plug, you, you transplant the plugs into a potting medium that does not have earthworms in them. And you get this, this is our control, they get this nice, neat growth after two weeks. And then the other, the other picture here shows you what it looks like when you put the plugs 
of that cilantro into the potting mix two weeks after adding the amethyst. So that there was a lot of castings already after two weeks. And what you see is stunted growth and a few other things. So you see this, uh, you know, the, root, the roots seem to be out of, uh, out of the, the soil after two weeks of growing them in that, in that uh, uh, medium with the worms. And you, you see uh, wilting, uh, th wilting uh, symptoms. And this, and then if you put the plugs and the worms at the same time, you have have a variety of responses. In some cases, the uh, the cilantro is dead. In some other cases, it has uh, the cilantro shows some kind of uh, um, deficiencies, uh, but it's very variable. Whereas if you put them put the plugs into the potting medium with with where the earthworms have been active for a while, uh, it's pretty much death and destruction. Uh, so here's one of the things you see, you could see the curling of the leaves and then uh, blackening of the leaf margins. Uh, there's a, a whole bunch of things that we, we just didn't, didn't diagnose this, um, but it could be different things. And, and Vern probably has some idea of what this might be. How to move around, horticulture compost, plant exchanges, recreation, earth moving, flowing water. So overland flow will move them around. Downhill, of course. So if you have if you have a source of these worms uphill from you, maybe in somebody's garden, then it is likely that um, that a big big storm event might might take them into your nursery or your your vegetable garden. Uh, so I'm going to put the spotlight on compost because this is this, this is something that irks me and and also that has come to the fore in the last couple of years. We get in so many uh, reports of these worms found in bulk compost but also in, in bagged compost. So beware of what you buy. And so this is the way this, this might work, right? So this, this is the way uh, 148 might be, Act 148 might moving these things around. So uh, for those of you who are not in Vermont, uh, it's universal recycling law of organic materials. And uh, this is a neighborhood close to where I, I live and they have jumping worms. They uh, rake their leaves, they put them in brown bags or they take, take the leaves straight down to the transfer station there. Uh, people come and say, ooh, leaf mulch, I love it. It increases my organic matter. Let's get some of that. And then it, from there, it goes to a variety of different places. And so this here is probably riddled with these, with, with these worms. And so will these places be after you transfer this stuff. Uh, wood mulch is, by the way, by the way can also be uh, um, contaminated. So can they survive the hot temperatures of compost? Yes, they cannot. So no, they cannot, I should say. Worms and cocoons die at 38 degrees Celsius or 105 Fahrenheit. So if they're in the hot zone of that windrow, they'll die. However, in windrow composting, um, the worms have some time. You know, you, you turn that windrow and uh, you mix it and, and it takes some time for, for that winter to heat up. So in the meantime, these worms are moving towards the outside of the windrow and, and cooler places. In fact, in some of the contaminated windrows, you can put your hand in and you can throw like maybe two or three inches and you can pull a bunch of worms out. So this, uh, this number, by the way, comes from Johnson and Herrick, uh, 2019. And they did some experiments on this. So uh, the question you have to ask is, is the compost from windrow or aerated static pile? So area the static pile gives you a much more uniform um, distribution of temperature through the pile. And especially if there is a compost cover on top of it, which is frequently done because of odor. Um, and in, in particular, if the unscreened compost cover is also covered by some kind of uh, filter fabric um, that sometimes is put over these things. The problem is even, even when you have these aerated piles, um, you know, here's, here's a layout of, of one of these operations. This is super hot here. This is an, aerate, this is an aerated, aerated operation. Uh, this should be, should be giving you really hot temperatures all the way through. And so all the, all the worms and all the cocoons are dead. <clears throat> but the next step is that you are moving these piles to um, piles that are therefore curing, right? So it's a curing pile down here and they're getting cooler. And if you have these ones on your, on your premises as a composter, 
the worms will probably invade these and be happy to be in there for three months and lay, lay their cocoons. So uh, it's the static pile is not a foolproof way of keeping things worm free. It's a first step towards that. So can that be controlled? This is what you've been waiting for. What do we tell panic callers? Uh, but if you haven't gotten them yet, we're kind of saying, keep it that way. Propagate from seed and cuttings, exchange bare root plants, solar, solarize your solarized soils and soil materials you buy in. And then finally, so, uh, one thing that, that has come up in come some of the meetings I attended the last few weeks, um, you can, there's, there's some evidence that prairie vegetation, and I'm not sure uh, what exactly the seed mix would be, uh, could, could be good buffers or, or potentially covers uh, cover vegetation in, in your operation. And it seems that prairie vegetation is not susceptible uh, to these worms coming in. So I've heard of one study saying that, that study has to be repeated, but it might be a first step in, in, in the right direction for anybody who, who wants to go by current scientific knowledge. So you, you already know how to do this, right? So I don't have to tell you about any of that, but solarize everything prevent invasion, right? So in, prevent invasion from compost, mulch, and soils, uh, leaf mulch, whatever you bring in. Um, and you, the best way to do this, this work, worked for us this last summer, is to uh, get some cheap translucent painters plastic cloth. You put it on the ground so that the earthworms uh, cannot escape the compost when it heats up. Then you, you put the compost on about six to eight inches deep. Uh, you can make this like 10 to 15 feet long. Um, and then you put put your compost and mulch in there and, and, and even if you if you make your own uh, potting mixes um, which you probably don't have to because you you are probably not doing uh, not selling things by in pots but even then you could put put that on, on into one of these sandwiches and you cover then the soil um, or the compost with another sheet you tuck it under and then you kind of wrap wrap the bottom sheet over the top of the top sheet so that you have you have something that prevents the worms from escaping. So after two days in the sun, I would say as of May uh, in, into August, uh, you probably have a worm-free mulch. So you can, you can get up to 150 degrees there when you do this properly. Avoid shade, of course, don't have to say that. If you got them already, here's this, don't let the worm shame you, don't panic, uh, you know, you have them, you know, I mean, you, I allow you some grief, but then go into action and see what, what there might be that you can do. One of the things that I find that in organic seed beds that have been prepared, I find very few earthworms. So my thought is that maybe uh, tillage will do pretty well for you if you kind of keep tilling. Of course, that's not a no-till operation and you wonder about what's going to happen to my my wonderful soil, soil, soil health once I do this, but you know, it gets rid of the worms. Maybe you have to do it a few, few years and then you can go back to your no-till. Uh, then it sort of depends when you do this. Well, I mentioned already, whatever you do, you want to really do when, I have to find my mouse here, when these worms are at their peak, sometime mid-May to mid-June, maybe twice, who knows? You may probably want to do it before you plant anything. Um, if you have, permanent beds, you know, you're growing, obviously you're growing blueberries, raspberries, etc. cetera, uh, then you have to find other things to do. Um, if you, if you have, uh, if you're producing some, some, if you're producing some of your, uh, your stuff in cuttings or in, in, you're making seedlings, you may want to raise that up, uh, th those pots up from, uh, from the soil, uh, from, from the surface, maybe put the, the bench, bench legs on into soapy water. Um, Biocontrol, uh, we are working with uh, entomopathogenic fungi at the moment, Boveria bassiana and Metarhizium. Brunium has been, uh, and isoply is, 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 uh, is the synonym for that. Um, so Metmaster or uh, Botanigard seems to work pretty well. However, there's a couple, there's two howevers. The first however is uh, none of these are really certified for use in earthworms yet, and uh, I'm hoping to get an experimental uh, experimental uh, certification for these from, from the state so that I can do some work in the field with these. Um, 
And then uh, the other the other thing is that that off the shelf these things don't work. You have to uh, get a pure culture of them. And we're working on a way of for you to get not only a pure culture, for you to make a pure, pure culture and to uh, and to also mycotize some millet with it, so you grow the the uh, bio pesticides on the millet. Um, so this is what that looks like. Down here, you have mycotized millet. So this granular formulation is easier to spread. In addition, it seems to be something uh, that the worms are attracted to. They love millet. Um, as some of our uh, more uh, blunderous experiments have shown, if you have if you put too much millet down, they they actually get a lot of strength and they grow and and they don't seem to worry about the uh, Bovaria bassiana has to be the right amount. Uh, anyway, so uh, here's a graph of, of one of the, our uh, uh, bio assays. Uh, mortality is on the on the y-axis here in percent, and then the treatments are on this on over here. So if you just use millet, 15 grams that is mycotized, then we get about 80, 90 percent of uh, mortality. If we just put 15 grams of millet, the worms are pretty happy. There's no mortality. If we put 25 percent. Uh, we get pretty much the same mortality for the uh, the mycotized millet, uh, but and and a lot lower mortality uh, for the 25 grams that you've been putting out there uh, without the without the the uh, Bovaria bassiana grown on it. If we do this without millet, we spray Bovaria bassiana uh, cultured from botanic art onto the worms directly. Um, we get a we get a mortality of about eight, 75 percent as well. So it's it's the it's the botanic guard that kills them. Um, and so we, we're working on a way that you can make your own. Unlikely solutions, parasites. So here's a here's a picture of a for worm uh, on the right hand side here. It's a picture of a worm with parasites in them. In them, you see these uh, these red headed worms, um, and you see these little pearls. We call those pearl parasites. And if you open those up, you see a whole bunch of funny little uh, creatures inside that. But it seems that it doesn't make any difference at all to the number of worms. So it seems that they look poorly to you, but they seem to be surviving. So good parasite doesn't kill. It just uses the resources. What we haven't figured out yet is whether this makes a difference in terms of the cocoon production. Uh, but we know that the worms live for a long time with their parasites. More interventions that are possible, so uh, naturally occurring micropathogens. Uh, we've, we've looked at that. We ex extracted some pathogens from, from dead bodies uh, and cultured them. And you know, here's a control. We didn't, we didn't spray, spray the worms with this control, but we sprayed them with penicillium, uh, staphylococcus, and bacillus, uh, and we get really high, up to 100% mortality. That's a lot higher than that. that that percentage mortality for the control. So that's how we know that it works. And it seems that it also has a, a, uh, an effect on the cocoons, but by far not as much mortality in the cocoons. We're talking about 20% versus 80 or 100% uh, for, the, for the worms proper. Other interventions, so some people are talking about flatworms, so uh, planaria, uh, they're ex exotic invasive species that have a high highly toxic substance in them. That's the same as what you find in uh, puffer, puffer fish. And uh, that toxin can persist in the environment. So you don't want these. Don't do it. Uh, some lizards are vermivores. Birds eat them. But then again, I, I remind you that, that these, these creatures are probably be overloaded with toxic trace metals. And then I had an experiment in Rhode Island um, where I, with earthworms and it got invaded by, by ants and that took care of the, the, the earthworms for sure. And this was actually um, an agricultural experiment where, where I tried to see whether um, some of the European earthworms are good at adding nutrients to, to a, an ag field. And, but they're all dead after the, the, uh, the ants got in there. Chemical controls, we worked with soaps, uh, so active ingredients, saponin, which there's a picture of it there. And if you really want to memorize it, you probably have to watch this this uh, uh, seminar several times over. Um, so uh, we wanted to know, so soap is supposed to be really good for killing the worms, but we also want to know what happens to, to the plants that, you know, here's a, here we used um, geranium as one of the, the uh, plants, uh, the assay plants. 
And so we also did vinegar, and this is actually re re reporting on nasturtium. Uh, it had a much more dramatic effect on nasturtium than on, on the geranium. Geranium, you actually had to measure root mass and all that kind of stuff to figure out what happens to the plants. But you notice there's micro, micro, so there's, there's three sections on here. There's um, white, uh, yellow, and red. And the white section there is, uh, is where we investigated the effect of mycotized millet, either Boveria bassiana or Metarhizium brunium. And, uh, and uh, there, was, there was an increased mortality uh, over the controls, so those plant millet worm, plant worm. Um, <clears throat> treatments, which are shown here in the bottom part of the white section. And so this, these were uh, significant differences to that. That means that these are effective. Um, and guess what? This, this white area, the plants were un, unchanged. They grew the way they were supposed to grow. Uh, when we looked at soap, so five milliliters, 10 milliliters, and 100 milli, uh, 20 milliliters, then uh, we saw some mortal increased mortality, but we also saw, saw slowed plant growth. Actually, the five milliliters per five gallons um, was actually pretty good. It, it, the plants were retarded a little bit in their growth, but not all that much. And so we, we're, looking, we're gonna look at, at more soap treatments. Uh, by, the, by the way, botanical soap does not work. It's not based on saponins. It's uh, some kind of phosphorus or potassium. A compound that is in there and doesn't make any difference at all. It kills the plants, but it does not kill the worms. Uh, and then Joseph, vinegar. I just want to make sure we leave some time for Judy and also yep, I'm, I'm, I'm done in a second. So uh, it killed, and the vinegar killed the plants as well as the worms. So vinegar is really good killing the plants, but uh, the worms could also dead it. The plants could also dead it up. Uh, so I won't give you the summary here, but I just want to say one more thing. There are no chemicals or biopesticides that are currently certified as vermicides. We're working on it. And that's it. You know, Mariam Nuri Ayn did most of the hard work for us. And then there's a whole bunch of funders. And I want to really give a shout out to the Vermont Agency of Agriculture Specialty Crop Block Grant people. Uh, they they uh, actually use, so that's the USDA, USDA funded block grant. And they actually uh, saw the light and, and gave us money. With that, questions or, or Judy? Great, thank you so much. Uh, super interesting, lots of great info. There are some great questions in the chat. We probably can't get to all of them, but Becky, perhaps you could answer, uh, could call out a few of those um, while I pull up Judy's presentation for her. Hi, Becky. Hi, Joseph. That was really in illuminating, informative, and terrifying. Thanks. Yes. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of questions, I think, um, to pull out a few. Um, let's see, somebody wanted to know how the worm density, this is from Hans, in the cilantro experiment relates to density in natural settings, any ideas? Yeah, uh, thank you Hans for that question. We, we added uh, five worms to that and that is well within the range of densities that you see in, in nature, um, at nat or in, in natural, or in the field. I shouldn't, you know, uh, in, in in Japan, uh, the density is much lower. Uh, we had a really hard time finding those worms in Japan, but there's a lot more of those worms. There's, there's more competition among the, the worm species, um, and there's there's different kinds of uh, there's different kinds of uh, um, litter there that, that that might not be as as good as as what we here, have here for uh, sugar maple litter. Yeah, so it's, it it is pretty similar in terms of. So pretty similar in the pots as it is out, out in, in nature. Thanks. Okay, with that, we have Judy's slides. I hope you can see those. And uh, Judy, we'll let you take it away and just give me a little guide, one to advance. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and if people have questions for me, you can also email me. My email is right there uh, and I will get back to you on those. So next slide, please. So I'm here to talk to you about the spotted lanternfly. And one thing I'd really love to know is if you want to put in the chat whether you've ever heard of this insect before. And even if you have not, um, we're just trying to get a sense of how widespread is the knowledge about this pest. I'd also like to take this moment to thank Ginger Nickerson since I totally stole this slideshow from her. So the native range of the spotted lanternfly is um, of this insect is uh, in, it's Asian, but it's in China, Vietnam, and India. 
And in 2004, they found it in South Korea. So it's an invasive insect over there. And they've been helping us answer some of our research questions by sharing their research. Uh, next slide, please. So it was first found in Berks County, Pennsylvania, which is on the eastern side of Pennsylvania in 2014. We think it had been there for at least a year or so. And we think it came in on a load of stones. Um, you can see from this map, the blue areas are counties which have spotted landfly infestations. So from Pennsylvania, it's spread to neighboring states. It's an excellent hitchhiker. Um, and so uh, you see it hitchhikes quite well. And uh, railroads and other rights of ways are big pathways of transmission of this pest. Um, and then places like Maryland hold um, you know, horse events. So people come from all over the place with their trailers that sit out there with all the insects and then they drive around and go back home and they're carrying their little friends with them. So there are 11 states now with breeding populations. And please note that Vermont is not one of them. We do not have this insect. Um, it has been found live in New Hampshire, but they have believe they've eradicated all of those. And if you look on this map and squint, you can see tiny red dots and those indicate counties which had live finds that were eliminated. So we had a live find in Rutland last year and we believe that's eliminated. So next slide, please. Um, so what are these things and why do we care about them? Well, they're a hemipteran, which is a true bug. Um, they're in the family Fulgoridae, which is a, a worldwide kind of funky looking insect. Um, but they can become really abundant, as you can see from this photo. And they're, even though they're a plant hopper, they act like a big aphid. They just excrete honeydew. And since they're big, that's a lot of honeydew. And so imagine that your whole deck is covered with sticky, gooey honeydew that has attracted sooty mold. So it's a dark covering. And then it attracts stinging insects. So um, the nuisance factor is quite high. And then it can do some harm to vegetation and crops, um, which we'll talk about momentarily. Next slide, please. So it can do feeding damage. That arrow on the left points to the sucking piercing mouth part. Um, and on the right, you see the honeydew that has attracted mold. And that can block photosynthesis. And it's not quite clear um, how much that limits growth. Um, Study results have been ambiguous, so there's um, obviously a lot of factors we haven't sussed out yet. This insect has only been in the country for seven and a half years, so, and we had never heard of it before, really. Um, let's move to the next slide, and I can talk about some more specific um, plants. So this is a black walnut, and you can see the feeding damage, um, particularly on new um, shoots and stems. And it also can really harm younger or smaller um, trees, but it doesn't really damage the woody vegetation. It's not a tree killer, um, although this black walnut looks pretty bad. But really, the only thing that it, it has killed in large quantities have been grapes, which is not good news if you're a grape grower. So for those of you who might grow uh, fruit trees or berries, um, they have been doing some feeding studies. So one of the questions we had was whether this insect um, needed tree of heaven to complete its life cycle, but it turns out it can live on other trees, but not all the things that it loves to eat sustain its complete development. So it loves grapes. Um, like I said, it harms those. Whoops, back to the, that one, yep. Um, and then other crops of importance to Vermont, like hops, and for some reason, cucumbers, um, it can, uh, again, it won't kill them outright, but it can have um, a detrimental effect on the growth of these. Um, the same is true for raspberries. It will feed on blueberries, but doesn't seem to do a lot of harm to them. So next slide. Um, let's just work through its life cycle. And then I have some good news for you. So the um, upper left is an egg mass. And so much like the insect formerly known as a gypsy moth and now known as a spongy moth, um, the eggs are laid um, and have a protective covering over them, which in this case looks like mud or a lichen. And they're apparently really hard to see when you don't have a nice closely focused photo. Uh, the nymphs are quite small when they hatch. So they hatch from an egg into a nymph and that's called a first instar. So 
the first through third instars, each molt is a new instar, are black insects with white dots. Then the fourth instar is red, white, and black. And then they molt and become the adult, which can be quite brightly colored when its wings are spread, but they're usually in that folded up position. Um, so the good news is that the adults are vulnerable to frost. So if we go to the next slide, we can look at the timing of their life cycle. So they lay their eggs in the late summer and fall, and the, the insect overwinters in the egg phase. Then they'll start to hatch in May or June. And please note that these dates are from Pennsylvania, so they may slightly differ when this insect gets up here and encounters colder temperatures. Um, so they're in their nymphs until say mid-July, maybe into the beginning of the fall. Um, but the adults start showing up in July, August and start laying eggs. Um, I remember in Vermont when we used to get a hard frost right at the end of August and you had to get your garden in by then. Uh, but now um, sometimes we don't have a frost till late October. However, it's still good news that the adults will just um, get hammered and stop laying eggs as soon as there's a frost. And again, we initially thought that they might need Tree of Heaven to complete its life cycle. Um, it doesn't, it can reproduce on um, seven other species, including black walnut. Um, but it, when it has Tree of Heaven, its offspring are much more robust and it can produce more of them. So what we don't know is how much Tree of Heaven we have in the state of Vermont. And one thing we're gonna um, ask you if you go to the next slide um, is to help us find Tree of Heaven. So I'm gonna give you some quick Tree of Heaven identification tips. Um, it's a compound leaf. So it has opposite leaflets along a stem and one pointy guy at the end. Uh, if you crush these, they have a bad smell. The edges of the leaflets are smooth, but if you look on the upper right, you'll see that at the base of the leaflet, there are two glands on either side of a little uh, divot at the end of the leaf. And in the fall, you'll see the characteristic fruit, um, which has a sort of pinkish appearance. Okay, so let's run through that again. They're compound leaves with smooth edges. They have two pimple looking glands at the base of the leaflet. They have a distinctive looking fruit and they smell bad when you crush them. So if you see them um, in a, another minute or two, I'm going to give you a place where you can take a photo and um, send it to us because we we really we haven't been able to get money to do a survey, and we're a small department, so we haven't been able to get out there and survey except a little bit in Brattleboro. Next slide, please. So management, there are things you can do once it get here, once the insect gets here and establishes a breeding population, and at that time we'll start putting out information about it. Right now, we're focusing on stopping the spread. Um, so what we're asking is if you leave the state to pick up plants somewhere, or if you're bringing plants in, if you could check them. Just if you're bringing in trees, lay them down, look at the tops for egg masses. Um, if you're bringing in equipment, just go through and see if you see any egg masses or any moving insects. Uh, if you take a car somewhere to pick up plants, come back and just take a flashlight and run through it. Make sure you didn't bring any friends back with you. You don't have to do that right now when it's 15 degrees out, but later when it's warmer. Um, again, I mentioned they're a strong hitchhiker. They can also be hard to see. You look under the car and you think they're mud. Um, they did this interesting uh, dislodgement study where they put live insects on a car and then blow a fan on them to see what it took to dislodge them. In every place they put them, some insects were able to hang on. Most got blown off, but not all. Um, so again, we're asking you to screen your incoming stock. They like plastic. They like anything they can lay an egg on. Um, they like the undersides of vehicles. So the best thing we can do to help ourselves is keep the insect out of here. So making sure you're not bringing it in with you is step one. What I found in my 35 plus years of working with invasives is if you can keep them out, you're much better off. It's hard to get rid of them once they're here. Um, so if you think you have it, let us know, take a picture. Um, if you see Tree of Heaven, please let us know. So we'd like you to report these things to www.vtinvasives.org. Um, and they have a report it function that you can pop a photo up to and that would be under terrestrial plants. And next and last slide, please. 
Oh, sorry, I forgot there's some good news. Just to summarize, so hard frost kills adults. We might not have a lot of T of eight, TOH, tree of heaven. Um, it doesn't kill trees and we don't have it. Uh, the next slide is some resources. And I'm happy to take questions by email. I just wanna give um, Yosef a few minutes to answer his questions. I have a meeting at one, I'm sorry to say, but I told him I'd be late. Thank you. Vern, you're muted. Thanks for the update. Lots of great info there. And we'll post these slides. Um, as well as the video so people can follow up. I have, I have a request. And the request is I'm looking for some uh, participants that would try, like to try out some best practices or some practices that would keep the worms out um, or that would control those worms. Um, so I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm hoping to get, uh, get a certification or registration for uh, experimental certification for Bovaria Bassiana. Uh, and uh, if that happens, then uh, I could, and I'm sure that will happen, I will get out there and, and try to apply some of this. Uh, so anybody who's interested in, in that kind of research, uh, whether it is, whether you have the worms, in which case you might wanna try some of the things like tillage um, or, or, or these Bovaria Bassiana treatments, or if you don't have them, would you like to try and keep them out and uh, document some of the uh, practices that that uh, that might keep them out? So, Joseph, is there a centralized reporting uh, plan, much like Judy's trying to collect information on Tree of Heaven to, to know where these worms are, if people can send them in for ID or send photos for ID? Yes, yeah, so you can send photos to me. Uh, so my my I'm going to put my email in the chat. Or you can you can upload pictures to uh, iNaturalist or uh, VT Invasives. Um, those apps will, will allow you to to add pictures, and then you can then geo geo reference them. You can give you can give them coordinates. You can I think this I, smartphones do this automatically, right? They know I had where a they quick are. Question about I mean a lot of people do buy in potted plants. Um, is it a possibility to soak things in water before planting and will the worms um, leave the soil and float to the top in that case? So what I would, yeah, this, this is a big deal, right? So uh, it's a big deal because if you soak them in water, you're not killing the, you're not killing the cocoons. So if there's already cocoons in that, then you have them and you don't know that you have them until they hatch and until you see the worms. So it'll be a couple of months after after you, you buy those potted plants. So one way of, right. of dealing with it is to uh, either request them as bare root or, or create bare root yourself, right? So, you, and bare root is not that difficult. So there, there are some nurseries that, that sell bare root plants, uh, bare root uh, shrubs even, and trees that do that. And I wonder whether, you know, this is probably one of the things that I'd like some of the nursery people to try is to see whether if there was a, a washing station, root washing station on premise, if they set, set something up, um, whether uh, consumers are willing to, uh, to do that for themselves. I mean, it's, it's an additional, additional step of work, right? It's, it's, it's tough for nursery owner to do this. Uh, but so I just got an email from somebody in, in Washington DC who uh, for the first time in her, nurse, in her nursery life has these jumping ones. And she's repotting 20,000 20, plants. So I know that's nothing for a horticulturalist repotting things, but 20,000 plants, that's a lot. And uh, in, into, sterile, into sterilized uh, potting medium. But, um, but so that there, there are people that are, that are willing to go as that far. So why would they go as far as selling you uh, bare root? Well, good. Thanks for the info again. Um, it is one o'clock, so I know some people have to go. Um, appreciate your contact info. We'll be posting your information on the Veggenberry website and uh, wish you all an excellent afternoon. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you, Vern. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. And thanks to Joan for posting at NOFAR and H. That'd be great. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks a lot.